This is a demonstration of synapses changing real time. Well, as you all know in science class, safety first, right? So I think probably if we're going to have people up here, we should uh, make sure students involved in demonstrations have goggles on. OK, let's try it again. Introduce yourself, shake hands. OK, so. <laughs> Okay, flip the goggles off before you go back to your seat. You can take the goggles back with you. Okay. As you probably gathered, they're not quite regulation goggles. Any idea what was going on there? You saw them sort of trying to... So, right, there's some kind of visual disruption going on there. We're going to take a couple of minutes to let you investigate for yourself what that experience is like. So try some sort of common task that you can do sitting at your table. Try shaking hands, try writing your name on a piece of paper, some kind of everyday task. So what I'm going to have you do in your group is come up and grab five beanbags. One of you is going to be wearing the goggles and you are going to be the subject throwing, okay? One of you is going to be responsible for recovering bean bags and passing them to that person so the only thing I want the person with the goggles doing when you're collecting data is throwing. So one of you is going to be passing the bean bag and you throw. All right, so one, two. So we're counting how many that she gets in. Keep going. Three, six, seven, eight. Another perfect eight. All right, ready? Get them adjusted. Oh Go. I'll make sure you don't fall. Um. <laughs> just, just throw. Just throw. Just throw. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There's so far zero. Ah, oh, one got in. One out of fives. One out of six. One out of seven. Two out of eight. If we let Jessica go on longer, I think she would achieve 100%. Basically, we're making you use your, your foveal central vision, and I'm not letting Jessica move to pick up her own um, bean bags. I'm not letting her adjust by going to a table or learning to interact with the environment in any other way because I'm trying to train very specific circuits. You can see how many throws it took before you accurately were able to meet criterion and get the bean bag in the box. There was relearning going on. It's not just visual input you're changing, it's visual input and the motor output, the aim part of the throwing that has to compensate for the visual input change. I would like you to collect data with a specific task for today. How long does it take before you're able to compensate to do a task? Okay, And then I would like us to follow up after we've compensated for the goggles, if we take them off, how long will it take us to go back to normal? Okay. By combining all of the data together in each condition, the effect of the goggles can be seen. This graph tracks how accurate each throw was, so you can see the learning and unlearning progression with the goggles on and off. You've had a chance to have the experience, collect your data, and then take a look at how some of the other groups went about answering the same question. So as you walked around, are there some ways that as a teacher you felt like, yeah, this is, this is good, this is easy for me to see what's going on, or things you preferred one way over another to represent? I can't unlearn what I already know, even though I, I knew I had to go throw it to the left. I mean, tell Hit the person sitting to the left of the box or whatever, but uh -huh. it didn't matter because the feedback that I was getting was to, it still didn't matter. You go to the left and you're still, this is what feels comfortable. And After the second throw, we all thought it was much better. Right. I saw that their original throws with the goggles were off to the left. Ah, so, so you were learning. Just going in. So does your data reflect that, that you compensated more quickly? I did better with the goggles on than I did without <laughs> What we did change at that point in terms of moving the visual fields with the goggles. So we changed the inputs in a major way. And it, 
if you compare what you were seeing with the goggles on to your internal representation of the world and how to move your arm to get to do the throw and get the bean bag in the box was the normal that you were comparing to, there was a real mismatch and you had to adjust. So what was going on in the central nervous system as you were adjusting? Right. Synapses were changing. Thank you. <laughs> this is a demonstration of synapses changing real time. You can see how many throws it took before you accurately were able to meet criterion and get the bean bag in the box. Uh, you actually have to change the circuitry when you try to hit it the second time. You changed your circuits. How does this show you that your neurons are plastic? Pedagogically, can we narrow the questions that we ha have our students do so that they get the idea of synapses changing as a take-home message from this experience? If you could design questions where the only possible explanation is that they're, that the circuits are changing, then you, then you could get them to that conclusion. So you'd have to do this activity probably twice, we decided. You'd have to go back and address all of the content like the synapse and neuron structure before you could really get them to the conclusion about changing its synapses. What we want to do today in follow-up to our Altered Reality 1 is Altered Reality 2. Um, think about some ideas that you might have or might have generated over your experience last week. Uh, bring those to the table with the group that you are working, at, working with. Try to develop a plan. Come up with your own question. Or if it is the same question, um, come up with your, an own, your own unique take on how that's going to maybe shape out or how it could play out in your classroom. So why is it? Why do you? Why can you still do video games, but you can't do things in three dimensions? Phones never really leave the buttons. Right. They're not usually looking at their phones. Yeah. Ta-da! I got it. A lot of information that's coming in, while it's wrong information, you have to be able to accept it in your mind. If you're, if you see the line way off to your left, you can't say, "I know that line's way off to my left." You have to accept that as just being the line. And you have to realize that seeing the feet out of the corner of your eye, you're seeing the feet actually right in front of you. And the faster you're able to accept that, and the faster you're able to realize this is a success, each step was a success, the faster you're going to adapt to it. Interesting experiment. You can see some learning happening here between trials one and four. But what happened between trial four and five? We need more information. You've approached altered reality from two different angles. One was guiding you with a lead question. Another was leaving it wide open for you to come up with any question. When it was more guided by one question, you were able to direct or be directed toward an idea about how your brains change, about synapses changing. And so you just have to think through what is my objective for altered reality? If I were to apply this in my classroom, what is my end goal? If you left it wide open, you may never get to the synapses change piece, is I guess what I wanted to make sure you kind of got. Using the goggles for getting the students to conclude that you can change your brain, using it as an illustration of brain changes versus the illustration of just inquiry processes. A young primate makes 40 to 50,000 new synapses every second. So that would be you know, zero to three for a human. All right? And that number of new synapses per second drops, granted from you know, those toddler years where you have to make sense of everything in the world, but it's still fairly high throughout your lifetime. An adult is even still making up to 10,000. We're not talking just one or two, we're talking massive changes throughout the brain. Mm -hmm.